Welcome and thank you for joining us at the International Relations Council for today's International Career Series with the Air Force. The International Career Series is designed to help you explore different international career paths, whether you're graduating and entering the job market, looking for a change, or just curious. You'll hear from an individual who can share their work in an international field, offering insight into their own educational background, career path, intricacies of the field, and recommendations for your own search. My name is Chrissy Kral and I'm an events intern this summer. For those unfamiliar, the IRC is a nonpartisan, apolitical organization that provides a platform for greater understanding of international topics and how they intersect with the Kansas City community. We will be recording today's event and broadcasting live on Facebook. So if you'd like you to review this conversation at a later date or share it with someone you think might enjoy it, feel free to visit our YouTube or Facebook page. This recording will join many others as a free resource for the people of Kansas City to use and revisit time and time again. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Captain Stormy Brewer, the Education and Recruiting Officer at the University of Kansas Air Force ROTC, who will be discussing her experiences with the Air Force. Captain Brewer graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 2012 and is a career aircraft maintenance officer. She has been stationed stateside in Arizona and Georgia, abroad in Italy, and is now currently located at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Captain Brewer is currently an assistant professor of aerospace studies at the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTC, Detachment 280, the Flying Jayhawk. In her current role, the primary duty is instructing cadets in their aerospace studies classes, but she also has additional duties in the Detachment Education Officer and Recruiting Officer. It is safe to say that Captain Brewer has fully engaged in the international experience, and we thank you so much for giving us some of your time. For this event, feel free to pose your questions through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen throughout the program, and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible during the Q&A period at the end. If you would like to connect with us at the IRC, please feel free to log on to our website, irckc.org, which will be also available in the chat box. We encourage you to check it out if you are interested in joining as a member, receiving our newsletter, or exploring other upcoming events. Thank you, and please wel welcome Captain Brewer. All right. Thank you, Chrissy. I appreciate the introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Chrissy stated, I'm Captain Stormy Brewer. I am currently a assistant professor of aerospace studies at the University of Kansas, Detachment 280, the Flying Jayhawks. Um, I am originally from a really tiny little town in New Mexico. I'm a career aircraft maintenance officer by trade. Um, as she stated, I've been stationed kind of all over. I've been stationed in Arizona, Georgia, and most recently I was in Italy before coming here to Kansas. So uh, today I want to kind of talk about each of those assignments. Um, what about each of those assignments really connected with being such an international related career field, being in the Air Force? I do want to give a disclaimer. So one of my additional duties is that I am the recruiting officer here for the University of Kansas, but that is different than being a recruiting career field. So my specialty code is not a recruiter. So unfortunately, I'm not able to answer, you know, medical questions about, hey, would I be eligible to join the Air Force? Um, I can answer questions about the ROTC program, absolutely. And I can definitely put you in touch with either enlisted recruiters, officer recruiters, or um, other detachments if you're not interested in coming to school at KU. But really today I'm gonna to talk about my personal experiences. So any person that you talk to in the Air Force or really in any branch of service, you are going to get very different perspectives because it's very rare that you meet two people who have the exact same uh, career, that have been to the same exact places, that have had the same exact experiences. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is very personal. It's just my experience, it's what I have seen. It is not the only experience that you can have. There's so many different career paths that you can take. This is just one person's uh, experience. So kind of take that with a grain of salt. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Let me share my screen. Okay, there we go. Chrissy, can I get a thumbs up that you can see those? Perfect, thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and start just on this big slide right here. So I took this slide directly from the Air Force's website. Um, and I really want to highlight the fact that we have bases all around the globe. So most people think of the Air Force, you think, you know, you may be stationed in a state that has an Air Force base near it. So we've got a couple of bases surrounding us. We've got Whiteman Air Force Base. It's in Knob, Noster, Missouri. We've got McConnell in Wichita, Kansas. We've got bases in Omaha, down in Oklahoma City. 
but we also have bases all around the world. We've got a couple that are in Europe. We've got them in the United Kingdom, Germany, Belgium, Italy. Uh, we've got bases in Asia. We have a couple in Japan, Okinawa. We've got a couple of bases in Korea. And then there are these locations that aren't necessarily an Air Force base, but that we have Air Force members stationed at. So uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, during my career, I've had friends that were stationed down in Central and South America. I've had friends stationed in Eastern Europe, uh, friends that were stationed at, at non-base locations throughout Asia. So really, we are kind of international. We've got people everywhere that are doing various different types of missions. Um, so let's jump into my personal experience. My personal experience, my first base was at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona, uh, in Tucson, Arizona. So I worked all platforms there as an aircraft maintenance officer. I was very fortunate. I got to work both the variants of C-130s that they have, HH-60 helicopters, and I got to work on A-10s. Um, one unique thing about Davis Monthan, or DM as we call it, is that DM is the headquarters for 12th Air Force. So that's kind of what I'm going to spend my time on this slide talking about. Uh, 12th Air Force is Air Force's Southern. So it's the air component for US Southcom. Okay, well, what does that mean? So this map on the right hand side of this slide is going to show what the area of responsibility is for United States Southern Command. So all of those countries that are shown on this map here. So really, when you think about it, it's going to be Central and South America. That's, that's what the area of responsibility is when we talk about Southern Command. So when we talk about 12th Air Force, the Air Force is Southern. It's really everything that the Air Force does to support that area of operations. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So 12th Air Force missions, there's a couple of main missions that they have, and that's going to be countering transnational organized crime, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and building partnership capacity. So there's two of those missions in particular that I, I really got to experience while I was stationed at DM, uh, the humanitarian assistance disaster relief and the building partnership capacity. So my personal experience with the building partnership capacity from a maintenance standpoint, when you look at the different airframes that we work uh, in the US with our Air Force, we're not the only country that has a lot of those airframes. So let's just look at an example, C-130s or F-16s. Those are pretty common airframes that a lot of other countries actually fly. And so when you look at how we conduct maintenance across those platforms, it's gonna be very similar because it's the same plane. So you're gonna conduct the same kind of maintenance from one country to another, or at least you have the ability to sometimes depending on the platform. Um, so one of the things that we did being stationed at DM is particularly when we had Spanish speakers or if we had anyone who spoke Portuguese, we would do exchanges and we would send individuals down into those um, Central and South American countries or those countries would send delegations of individuals up. We would do a bit of an exchange so that we could conduct joint training um, and, and really build those partnerships. So not only were we looking at technical aspects of how do we actually fix this or do this better, but looking at leadership aspects as well. Um, my last unit that I was a part of when I was at Davis Monthan was with the A-10 unit. We had a delegation of leaders come from Brazil. And so as part of our discussion, we gave our, our standard, we have a PowerPoint presentation that we give all of our distinguished visitors that shows what our, our mission is, what we do, what kind of sets us apart and why we feel that our unit is successful. And we took a pause and this delegation from Brazil um, stood off to the side, they were kind of whispering to each other in Portuguese. So we lean over to uh, the interpreter that was in the room with us and kind of ask, hey, what is there a question? Is there a concern? Something that we can clarify. And they were uh, fascinated by the amount of leadership that we give to our senior enlisted. And that's just something that's a little bit different than they did in their Air Force. And so that was an area that you can look at that um, though our job as, you know, just turning wrenches on the flight line, just fixing airplanes, you wouldn't normally think that that's a really international job because on a day to day, it's probably not. You can see that in those instances, when you have those international exchanges and those opportunities to kind of share best practices that we were able to maybe positively, in, um, positively shape maybe something that they would take away to perhaps implement in their own organizations. Um, and then vice versa, it's very interesting for us to see how other nations kind of organize, equip, and train their air forces and their maintenance units, or whatever your career field is, but in particular maintenance for me. So it's definitely a kind of a sharing experience, a learning exchange both ways. And so that was my really my first experience when it came to the building partnership capacity. 
And we did that with so many countries and, and there's countless examples, uh, but that's just the one that has always stood out to me with that Brazilian delegation that was there and just the amount of learning exchange that happened in that hour that we were, we were discussing kind of how each of our units and each of our organizations does things. So my second experience, I talked about um, 12th Air Force has multiple missions, but one of those is humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Um, so my second experience really was with this. Uh, in 2010, Haiti had a 7.0 magnitude earthquake and it really destroyed um, most of that area. Um, huge natural disaster. I think I, I've seen that it's in the top five or top 10 for the, the most destructive natural disasters in, in recorded history. Um, so I actually had peers, I did not, I was too young at the time, but I actually had peers that helped out with that humanitarian assistance, whether that be uh, flying in C-17s with aid and with relief supplies, or individuals that went out and helped repair the runway to make sure that the runway could even be utilized. Um, you think when an earthquake or a natural disaster, something like that happens, the runway was destroyed, uh, the port was destroyed. And so when you're looking at, well, how do we get humanitarian assistance in? You can't until you have those very basic transportation functions back open. And so now the Air Force didn't do all this alone, obviously. Uh, the Air Force was one very small piece of this. We worked with all the other sister services, our, our different DOD branches. We worked with the State Department, with US Aid. So there, there was multiple organizations, the Air Force just being a small part of it. But that's a really important and incredible opportunity to get to give back to the global community. When, when a lot of people think, again, of the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they don't necessarily think humanitarian aid. We think of warfare, we think of dropping bombs, but humanitarian aid is a really large part of what we do. And it's a great opportunity that we have to, again, positively impact our global community. And so it was kind of interesting to me that I not only knew people who helped with this particular uh, natural disaster, uh, but then personally, fast forward 10 years later to my previous assignment when I lived in Italy, I gained a new assistant officer in charge for the unit that I was in charge of. Um, and as my assistant, he, one of the first interactions we ever had, and it's, it's something that he was really proud of, um, he actually grew up in Haiti. He was there when that earthquake happened and he was very young at the time, but remembers the humanitarian aid. He was actually evacuated out on an Air Force C-17, on a US Air Force C-17. And that so positively shaped him that he openly still to this day talks about how that singular event caused him to join the Air Force. He set that in his mind that day that that was going to be his goal. And that's what he did. And now he's a commissioned officer in the Air Force. So he's kind of, you know, met his goal. Um, our previous base, Aviano, actually did a, a really great video piece on that where he talks about it. But that's just, just another one small example of the humanitarian aid and, and that outreach and how we can positively impact that global community. Um, and that's just, the, that makes the Air Force such an international career that again, you don't really think about the Air Force as something that is so positive in an international um, setting, but that's how it can help uh, impact positively our relationships abroad. Okay, so that was my experience. That was pretty much my first four years in the Air Force. I did deploy a couple of times um, while I was at Davis Monson, and I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end of my presentation. So after my four years in Tucson, Arizona, I moved to Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. So Robbins itself and the mission that I was a part of wasn't necessarily as international. So I wanna talk about the, the structure or the organization that Robbins falls under. So Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia does a lot of things. They are um, the largest single site industrial complex in the state of Georgia. So. Robbins Air Force Base has multiple organizations that fall under it. There's engineers, there are supply technicians, there is maintenance, all of the C-130s, C-5s, and C-17s in the Air Force inventory, along with the F-15s, go to Robbins Air Force Base for periodic um, heavy depot maintenance. It's, it's essentially, think about it, it extends the longevity of an airplane. Every six, seven, eight years, we will send an airplane to this base, to Robbins. It'll get completely stripped down. We'll inspect it, repair anything that's broken on it, repaint it, and send it back out to the field. And, and that is how we are continuing still to the state to fly airplanes that were built in the 1950s and 60s. So that is one of the missions that Robbins does. And as a maintenance officer, that's the mission that I was a part of. Not necessarily as international, though, because the focus really is on, on fixing and repairing our U.S. assets and sending them back to the field. So I want to focus on the organization that is, a, is above what we did, and that's Air Force Materiel Command. 
So Air Force Materiel Command is actually in Ohio, but they have a huge presence on Robbins Air Force Base. And so essentially what they do is research, development, test evaluation, acquisitions and management, logistics. They do everything that it takes to kind of help support our, our weapon systems. Weapon systems being all of our planes that we fly, being uh, all of the major equipment items that we use. So, so that's all kind of included there. So Air Force Materiel Command does a lot. They have a huge presence and a very large civilian workforce. But it, it goes without saying that if we're doing research, development, um, that's not something that we do in a bubble as a US. We recognize that there is talent in other countries, that there are people that maybe are subject matter experts on something that we're not, or that have a particular specialty in whatever technology it is that we're trying to acquire or integrate or um, build into our, our pre-existing airframes. So that's not something we do in a bubble. You can see on some of these past headlines here that I've listed up at the top right, and this is just a sampling of recent headlines. You see Air Force Research Laboratory there reaching out to technical innovators uh, within Israel to tap into partnerships. Uh, underneath that, there was a foreign liaison officer recognition ceremony because we recognize that those foreign partnerships we have are so critical to everything that we do. They're critical to our research, to our development. Uh, and then also, that goes without saying our acquisitions, our sustainment, our logistics, also equally as international and important that we develop those international partnerships. Um, the infographic here I have on the bottom right hand side is for the F-35 program and I took this directly from the Lockheed Martin website. So there's actually eight international program partners and six foreign military sales customers who participate in the F-35 program. So not only are these international partnerships here that obviously is an Air Force that we are a part of, but when you look at something that I, I do have a very close personal connection with logistics and sustainment of these platforms. So in maintenance, if something breaks, we typically will place an order through our supply system. Uh, that supply system, depending on where airframe you're working, typically is going to come from a, another U.S. Air Force base or another U.S. asset. But the F-35 is a joint program, so we may uh, order a specific component that breaks on an F-35 here in the U.S., and that component is coming from Turkey or it's coming from Italy or it's coming from the U.K., one of the other F-35 partners. So that's a really unique and pretty cool um, part of the F-35 program. It is a huge joint program, joint being focused on all those international partnerships. Um, similar to this, you see at the bottom up there, it talks about foreign military sales. So foreign military sales is another thing that we do in the Air Force. We have representatives from the Air Force that are stationed all around the world. They're not necessarily stationed at a base. They may be stationed at an embassy or in a state department or um, somewhere like that. And their job is to kind of be that Air Force liaison between the U.S. Air Force and the other country's Air Force when it comes to acquiring or um, contracts or logistics and maintaining platforms that we traditionally own in the U.S. So F-16 is a big one that in the U.S., if we sell any of our F-16 fleet to another country, that's always going to be managed by someone that is doing foreign military sales. And, and that is an opportunity as an Air Force officer that you get to do that. I actually had a really close friend when I was stationed in Italy that he was stationed in one of the Eastern European countries. Um, and that's exactly what he did. And he was a active duty Air Force officer, just like I was, but he wore a suit to work every day and he interacted with his foreign customers. He spoke that language. He was bilingual. Um, and that was his job every day. I had another friend who did the same exact job in South America. So you can see there, there are kind of those opportunities all over and neither one of them were located at a US Air Force base. They were both kind of off on their own. They might've been the only Air Force officer that was stationed where they were. And so you got a lot of autonomy there and a lot of ability to get out and to interact with our international partners to form those relationships. So really cool that you get to do that as an active duty Air Force officer. Um, something that I, I kind of wish I would have had the opportunity to do, but I've had a really incredible career. And instead of doing one of those jobs, we'll roll into my next assignment, which was an Aviano Air Base in Italy. So this was everything about this assignment was international. So I lived abroad. I got to live in Italy. Uh, and like most overseas assignments that aren't a deployment where you're stationed in a safe location, uh, you get to live off base. So I lived off base in a small Italian town in an Italian apartment with a landlord that did not speak any English, right? And so that kind of forces you to 
um, get out and interact and become a part of your local community. It's a really awesome opportunity that I highly recommend um, to anyone who, who wants to consider living abroad. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to um, get out and experience something a little bit different and maybe take off some of the blinders that you have on growing up. Um, you know, never ever in a million years at 15 years old, you know, I grew up in a double wide in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico. And if you had told 15 year old me that I would have the opportunity to live in Italy, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, so it was really incredible opportunity to get out there and be a part of that community. Uh, outside of work, I, in the two years that I was stationed there, I had the opportunity to travel to 16 different countries in Europe for leisure, just for, for travel on my own. And that is such an incredible experience. And, and even though I wasn't traveling in an official capacity, when you travel as an American, a lot of times people don't have a lot of interaction with Americans. So you may be that only impression that they get. So it's important that you kind of uh, represent a, a positive image of the United States and that you're not just um, you know, out offending that population wherever you're at or uh, making a fool of yourself or the country because you're essentially representing the US everywhere you go. So those international partnerships that we've talked about throughout this presentation absolutely applied here, as you can imagine, because we are the guests in their nation. It was not even a US Air Force base that we are on. It is an Italian air base that we just have a presence on. Um, so those international partnerships we talked about constantly training with our ally partners. So I put up a picture here on the right hand side that that was the unit I was actually a part of before I left. Um, so you can see here we've got not, not only US Air Force pilots, but we've got Israeli Air Force, Italian Air Force. And so this is just one example of the many joint trainings that we conducted that give you that opportunity to really reach out and get to know your international counterparts. Um, so we're constantly training, specifically in Italy, we were constantly training with our European counterparts and really with our Middle Eastern counterparts. So this assignment definitely solidified for me that the Air Force is a very international career and, and that we do have uh, an international presence, even if our primary duty isn't necessarily to be international focused. Um, there's still all those different missions that we do, like we talked humanitarian, um, all these training environments, and then just the leisure travel when you're in another country that, that definitely help to make uh, the Air Force a very international career. Um, and this solidified it for me because I got to see it every day. As I came into the gate, it may have been an Italian Air Force member or a U.S. Air Force member that checked my ID coming into the gate because, again, it's, it's an Italian base, so that joint partnership definitely there. Uh, so my time in Italy was amazing. I loved it, but after two years, it was time to come back to the States. So after two years, I did come back to Kansas and I'm stationed at the University of Kansas. I absolutely love it here. Um, a lot of people said, oh, how was that transition for you going from living in Italy to living in Kansas? Well, I've absolutely loved it. This is an incredible, uh, incredibly beautiful part of the country and really kind, warm people that are here. In my role as the assistant professor of aerospace studies, uh, it's really an instructor role. So not necessarily as internationally focused, but that's because I'm teaching the next generation of future leaders, right? And in order to progress in our program, you have to be a US citizen. So that's another reason why it's a little bit uh, less of an international focus in the role I'm currently in. Um, but I've been bit by the travel bug, obviously after living in, in Italy, so once it's safe to travel to some of the countries that I'd like to visit again, I definitely will start planning that international travel again. Uh, but this instructor role is, is really great because it gives me an opportunity to do things like this, to talk to groups of people about how incredible the Air Force has been. So again, caveat, I am not a recruiter. That is a, spe a specific specialty career field and that is not me. However, I can just talk to you very briefly about the Air Force ROTC program and some of your different options. So if you're thinking to yourself after this kind of short presentation, hey, that sounds really fascinating. How, how do I get there? What do I do? Well, there's a couple of different things that you can do. So being in the Air Force, you can be either enlisted or you can be an officer. Um, when you enlist, you can that's where you can just kind of Google, hey, where's my nearest Air Force recruiter? And you can walk into a recruiting office and you can talk to someone in a uniform and you can enlist that way. Uh, you can enlist right out of high school. You do not have to have a college degree. Uh, the Air Force is incredible that we have a tuition assistance program, so um, they can help, the Air Force can help you to pay for your bachelor's degree, for your master's degree. The Air Force helped me to pay for both my bachelor's and master's. Um, so that opportunity exists. If, you, if, you, if you're thinking to yourself, like, man, I just really don't want to go to college right now, but I would love to serve in the Air Force, so you can enlist. And 
there are so many enlisted AFSCs or, or Air Force Specialty Codes career fields that would allow you these same opportunities I'm talking about today, that would allow you to travel the world. Uh, if you want to go the officer route, it, you have to have a bachelor's degree in order to commission. There's three different ways that you can commission. You can go to the United States Air Force Academy. That's the route that I went. You can do Air Force ROTC, or you can go to OTS. Air Force ROTC is a perfect program if you are currently in high school right now and thinking, hey, I wanna go to college, but I would also like to work towards a commission. This is that route that you can do both at the same time. So you would attend either KU or one of our 10 crosstown agreement schools. Um, you would be a full-time student, 12 credit hours a semester at least. Uh, it is a four-year program. We do allow individuals to do five years. If they're in technical majors, a lot of our engineering majors can do five years. Um, you have to be in the program though for at least four years. And you would just essentially take your Air Force ROTC class in conjunction with all the rest of the classes that you take normally. Uh, we have PT twice a week and we do have a leadership laboratory that meets for two hours once a week as well. So you can look at your time commitment and think about it being about five or six hours a week. And, and that would be five or six hours a week for all four years of your college time. At the end of that, then you would commission and you would be a second lieutenant in the Air Force or the Space Force because we're also the commissioning source for the Space Force right now too. Uh, and then you would have all those wonderful opportunities I just talked to you about and your career would take you in, in one of a million different really positive directions. So that's if you're currently a high school student thinking about your college future. Um, additionally, if you're maybe a college freshman or you're starting college this semester or you've already done one semester, um, if you can stretch out to a three and a half year program, we will allow uh, individuals to condense typically to shave off one semester. They'll just double up on classes um, at, at one semester to do a program in three and a half years. So that's really the best option there. So if you're thinking, well, I'm already a sophomore or junior or senior or I've already graduated college, but this sounds really awesome. That's where the OTS route comes in, Officer Training School. So in order to attend OTS, you have to have graduated with your bachelor's degree. And that is the third way that you can commission. So there was the Academy, there's Air Force ROTC, and there's OTS. OTS, you can have your, you have to have your bachelor's degree already. You can have a master's degree, but a bachelor's degree is only what's required. Um, you'll apply on the OTS website. It, the, all of these are real simple. If you just Google Air Force OTS, it's like the first website that pops up and there's a place that you can apply there. Um, OTS then, uh, is varies from time to time, whether it's a 9, 10, 13, 14 week program. So it really depends on at what time you go as to how long the program is. Um, but all the training that we conduct in the four years in, in ROTC is essentially conducted in that condensed period of time. They give you all the military training you need. Here's how to be a, an Air Force officer. Uh, and then from there, you're commissioned as a second lieutenant, just like you are from ROTC, and you're sent off to one of those amazing career paths that we talked about. So those are really the three routes. Again, if you're a high school senior, maybe a high school or a um, college freshman right now thinking, hey, this sounds really interesting. I want to get involved with this. Air Force ROTC would probably be a really good route for you. If you're older than that, if you're a college sophomore or older, probably OTS would be the best route for you. Um, I am going to put my contact information here on the last slide for you guys so that you can reach out if you if you kind of want to know what is the best route for you. I'm more, more than happy to correspond with you guys on that. Um, but that's essentially in a nutshell what my role is here. I teach weekly classes every week, the air class that you have to take, I teach those classes. Um, last year I taught our freshmen and sophomores, this year I'm going to teach our freshmen and our seniors. So it, it's a really incredible opportunity to get to share and mentor uh, our future generation of leaders on, on what we expect of Air Force officers when they commission. So really fantastic opportunity. Um, Okay, so as, as I kind of wrap up here, I just want to say that I've talked about how my international experience during my nine year career, um, I've really talked about that international focus, right? But I did say I have deployed a few times as well. So I've also deployed to Afghanistan, Qatar, to Saudi Arabia, and when and where it was safe, I was able to get off base and into the local community and see those, those populations and interact with those people. And I just want to echo my previous comments that you learn so much when you're working with your counterparts in the military in our allied nations and really just getting out and interacting with the community in those areas. Um, you learn a lot. You are able to experience different things with a more positive view, positive lens, and it really humanizes the populations that we otherwise would normally just see or hear about on the TV when we hear about the wars that we're fighting. It really humanizes those those people 
um, and makes you appreciative of the positive uh, bonds and experiences that you can have with those individuals. So um, that has been another really international aspect of being a, a Air Force officer. Um, so the Air Force has been really incredible to me. I'm very thankful for everything that it has done, the experiences I've had, the friends that I have met, um, kind of that international focus that I never would have thought 15 years ago that my career would have turned into, that it has. Um, there's multiple routes that you can take to join the Air Force, like we talked about. And I really do think that there is something for everyone. There's a job for everyone. There's an experience for everyone. Uh, there's a base for everyone. There is something. So if this is something that any of you think that you might be interested in, definitely please reach out to me. Um, with that, I will open it up for any questions. So there is my contact info, uh, my email address. Just shoot me an email if you have any, any pressing questions that you don't want to talk about in this setting. Um, otherwise, I will open it up for any questions. Thank you so much, Captain Brewer. That was an amazing presentation. I can kick us off with a question, but as a reminder, anyone is welcome to chime in with theirs or text it in the chat box down at the bottom of their screen. I would really love to know um, what kind of drew you into the Air Force. You've had so many incredible experiences, but I was just wondering what kind of motivated you to get involved in the first place. Yeah, so uh, I come from a family that has a little bit of a military history. So uh, my one of my grandfathers was in the Army. My dad was enlisted in the Air Force. And so that kind of planted that seed for military service. Um, I, I didn't necessarily know for sure that I wanted to join the Air Force until a little bit later in, in high school. I thought, okay, well, you know, like, like a lot of people today, they're <laughs> tell them, hey, you're going to go to college. That's non-negotiable. I don't care what you go to college for, pursue whatever your passion is, but you need to have a college degree to, to kind of have a leg up and, and to be able to set myself up for a career that maybe was more challenging for them without college degrees. Um, so when the, the opportunity came up for me to apply for the Air Force Academy, it kind of combined both those passions. I got to go have that military service and also get my bachelor's degree and have my bachelor's degree paid for. Because as I mentioned, I, I grew up out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. And so uh, finances, I, I definitely, we could not afford to send both myself and my brother through college. My parents just couldn't afford that. So it was an opportunity for me to be able to pay for college um, and get to serve. And here I am, you know, nine years after graduation and I'm still doing it and I love it. Uh, the Air Force Academy, I do just want to point out, not the only way to have your college paid for. So if you are one of those high school seniors that we briefly talked about, we have a high school scholarship program for ROTC that you can apply for during the fall of your senior year in high school. And it's essentially a scholarship that'll pay tuition and fees. Um, depending on what type of scholarship you're awarded, it'll pay tuition and fees uh, at an in-state tuition rate. And uh, that'll be for all four years of your college. So that, that is incredibly helpful to pay for your college. And then at the end of that four years in our program, you would commission. So uh, multiple ways to help pay for college as well. That's kind That's of what drew me. dad being in the Air Force was kind of that that initial, but then all the other factors that, hey, I have this ability to still get a college degree and still work towards being in the military. And it was kind of a win-win situation. Perfect. Hi, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Arna and I work for IHC as our Global Education Coordinator. Your presentation was wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for doing this. Um, I I think I heard you saying that it's only, only US citizens who are uh, qualified to study in the uh, department that you're do, doing the teachings, but- yeah. Only, yes, you have to be a US citizen in order to commission as an officer. You do okay. not have to be a US citizen to enlist in the Air Force. Okay, so what if somebody has a green card, so permanent resident? So you must be an actual full US citizen. Mm. Okay. Yes. And unfortunately, we do have some individuals who are dual citizens in another country, and, and you would have to renounce your citizenship in the other country. You, you have to be a U.S. citizen and a U.S. citizen alone. So uh, to be a commission officer. important qualifiers to be an officer in particular. Uh, to be enlisted, I've actually known several enlisted that I've worked with who were not U.S. citizens when they enlisted. And becoming a, a member in the U.S. Air Force helped them work towards becoming a U.S. citizen. So... Awesome. Definitely the major difference there between being officer and enlisted. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. 
another question from the chat that we have is, um, you've talked a lot about all of your positive experiences in the Air Force, and it was very interesting to learn about those. Can you speak a little bit about maybe some challenges that you've had being stationed overseas, kind of combating homesicknesses or, um, you know, struggles with the languages? Absolutely. Like that. Yeah, I mean, you definitely nailed it. So challenges <laughs> being overseas, uh, if you don't speak the language, that, that can obviously be challenging. Anyone who has really done much travel abroad or in a, another country where English is not the primary language can definitely echo that sentiment. It can be challenging. Um, that said, if you go into it with an open mind and just acknowledge, hey, this, this is not uh, the U.S., this is not a country where English is the primary language. When you don't expect people to speak English to you and you go into it with an open mind, willing to learn and to be a part of that culture. Um, I, I always joke that pointy talkie goes a long way. So just being able to point to something and, and kind of do a, a charade, kind of acting something out using your hands. There are a lot of, of emotions that you can express on your face and with, with your nonverbal communication that can help to get that point across or can kind of help you figure out how to communicate. I have found that most individuals in, in foreign countries, if you make at least some attempt to um, at least say hello or something like that in, in their language, like, hey, you're taking the effort to try to not just be this obnoxious loud American who expects to come to my country and, and that I have to speak English to you. Um, but it's still challenging. So living in Italy, culturally very different. So I think I just saw a question pop up. Uh, what was the biggest culture shock throughout my career? Um, one big culture shock was just the, the much slower pace that Italians mm -hmm. live their life than, than we do in the U.S. I think we've got all kind of heard and have laughed or joked about at one time or another uh, how the U.S. is very fast paced. We are so go, go, go all the time. And that's not every career field, but but for the most part, if you look at us as a country compared to other countries, uh, we're very fast paced and we feel that, you know, we pride people on working really long late hours and working really hard at their jobs and um, maybe not putting family first sometimes so that they can keep climbing that career ladder to work towards that retirement versus you look at a lot of other countries around the world who say, well, I could die tomorrow. I'd like to spend time with my family and I'd like to get sleep and I'm going to take siesta and I'm going to do all these wonderful things, right? That is a little bit slower paced. So culture shock, it was challenging when I moved to Italy because um, the hours that things are open are very different. You know, things close from about two in the afternoon to 6 p.m. That's their reposo. That's like their, their version of siesta that they're closed down, don't bother them because they've gone home to either have a nap or to spend time with the family and they'll open back up at six. Uh, another culture shock is like restaurants don't open up until typically seven o'clock at night is when they start serving dinner. Um, you know, so there, there are those basics. Uh, paying your bills, a lot of places will still require you to go in person to pay your bills. You have to set up Italian bank accounts. And so this, obviously this experience is, is just my personal experience with Italy, but very transferable, I feel like, to an individual who moves abroad anywhere is going to maybe run into some of these same challenges. So then you add on top of that culture shock, the fact that you don't speak the language and and definitely there can be a little bit of homesickness. Um, you've got the spectrum of how people deal with that. Some people really thrive in that environment and, and they don't get very homesick and they look at every opportunity as or every challenge as an opportunity. And, hey, I'm going to go travel. I'm going to go do. I'm going to go see. Um, I, I found that I leaned more towards that because it didn't really do me any good to be homesick because, hey, I'm in, I'm here for two years. I'm not going back to the U.S., so I might as well make the best of it. I might as well travel my butt off. I might as well get out there and interact in my community. Uh, it, it can be very challenging, though, for individuals specifically who have grown up in one particular area and they've maybe always been close to their mom and dad and their grandparents, and so they are used to having that family support. It can be very challenging and a lot of folks do get homesick. Um, some folks will come back early from their assignment. So like uh, folks who come over to an overseas assignment like Italy and they bring their spouse and their kids, maybe the spouse and the kids will go back home um, early before the assignment is over just because th that homesickness does get pretty intense. Um, one really cool positive culture shock for me, uh, one of my deployments when I was in Qatar, I got to go out into downtown Doha pretty frequently because it was, it was a pretty safe area at the time that I was there. And one really fascinating culture shock is when you see the traditional dress 
you'd see kind of the full spectrum of very plain to fabric. You'd see that traditional dress that was then adorned in beautiful jewels and gems. And then right next to that woman, you would see a woman wearing a crop top, right? And so you've got this really mashing of um, different cultures that when you're in your head thinking before I had ever been to those locations, before I'd been anywhere in the Middle East, I just pictured in my mind what I thought their traditional attire would look like and that what I thought their culture would look like and how I thought they would act. But then when you see it for yourself, it, it's just, it's fascinating. And it was a really positive culture shock for me that there's, there's all this kind of variety in these different places that you can go. So I would say th those were the biggest culture shocks. Homesickness a little bit, um, not as much because at that point in my career, I hadn't lived at home since I was 17. So I, I had been out of my parents' house for 11 years and traveled quite a bit in my, my different assignments. So not as homesick, thankfully. Um, just the slower pace of living in Italy, which was a huge culture shock and I ended up absolutely loving. And I thought, why don't we do this in the US? Why don't we just <laughs> slow down and enjoy our life a little bit more? So uh, it, definitely a bit of a culture shock. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I noticed in your presentation, you talked a lot about leadership in the Air Force which I love. Um, I personally am getting a leadership minor at my university, so I love talking about that, but I would really like to know what knowledge or skills have you noticed are kind of most useful in your field and how would you recommend someone uh, not in the Air Force yet to kind of grow in those before they are thinking about joining? Yeah, absolutely. Leadership is really one of those very beautiful universal concepts that whether you're in the military and you're a military leader, or you are a manager and a supervisor in a civilian company, um, whether you're a teacher, it does not matter what you do, you can have those same leadership skills. Um, if I had to narrow it down to some of the most important skills that, that I personally think uh, serve a leader well, and that's a leader in any organization, humility is a big one. So just being able to humble yourself and acknowledge when you are not the expert in something, when you're not the best at something, um, when you couple that with the ability to want to serve the people in your organization, whatever organization that is. So if you're the principal of a high school, then you know serving not only your student population, but your teachers, your staff. Uh, when you want to combine humility and acknowledging that you may not be the best person at what you do, you may not be the smartest at what you do. In fact, you shouldn't be. You should surround yourself with people who are the best at what they do, right? That's who you want on your team. So when you couple that with your desire for service, and again, that service is not just military service. That's if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a nurse, a social worker, or even if you work at a Fortune 500 company and you're a financial planner, right? There's always going to be some service aspect to anything that you do as a supervisor, as a leader. Um, so when you couple that desire to want to make your team better with your humility, you can really empower and encourage your workforce to rise to, to the occasion and perform at their best. When you motivate and inspire the people that, that work with you and for you, or that you work for really, because when you're a leader, you're working for those people, right? It's your, it's kind of the opposite of what you think. Um, that really can be a very positive quality in, in a leader, regardless of what aspect you're leading in. So acknowledging that humility aspect when you're not the best, when you're not the smartest, build yourself up a team of people that are the smarter people, that are the better people at what they do empower them and encourage them to do their jobs and, and to and to do their jobs well. I have seen some really incredible performers throughout my career that I think every single one of us acknowledges that it feels good when a supervisor or someone recognizes the hard work that we put into an organization. And so when we are that supervisor, just keep that in mind. Well, hey, it feels really good when someone tells me I did a good job or when someone mentally challenges me to do something or, you know, so then be the leader that does that. Right? Empower your folks to really take on whatever their project is and encourage them. And it's amazing how well some people can do when, when you just kind of loosen up the reins a little bit and let them go with whatever their project is because you, you have recognized that they are the expert at that. So I would say those are some basics. I mean, I could talk about leadership all day long. It's probably one of my favorite things. And um, in the sophomore class that I taught last year, that's pretty much the curriculum for the entire year is, is talking about leadership. So. There are so many skills that you can pick up, and I would just encourage anyone here who wants to be a leader in whatever their organization is, um, go take a class at a community college or a university. You can sign up for different series that you can listen to. You can watch TED Talks. 
there are so many ways that you can take in information, but you have to want to do it. You can read books on it. You can listen to podcasts. But the, the first step is just acknowledging, hey, I want to be a better leader. How do I get there? Um, and you've heard me say it already, but Google can be your best friend. And if you Google those resources, you can find a ton of resources out there that will help you to get to where you want to be as a leader. Perfect. Thank you. Just to kind of close this off, what final advice would you give to a young professional looking to make themselves competitive for work in this space or maybe thoughts on why they should be interested in joining the sector in the first place? Yeah, so uh, I think that the Air Force is an amazing opportunity to get to travel and see the world, financial stability, um, that call to service. There, there are a lot of really positive things about the Air Force. So advice I would have for maybe some young adults, um, again, depending on where you're at in your career, don't ever let someone tell you no. So if you are young enough to apply for a high school scholarship, then do it. If you're kind of past that point or you're past the point where you can do ROTC, well then apply for OTS and keep applying until you uh, get picked up for OTS if, if this is your ultimate goal. But I do just wanna point out that there are so many ways to serve, that the Air Force is just one of the many ways to serve. Um, we talked about some of those others, serving your community as a teacher or as medical firefighter. There are so many things that you can do. Um, find something that you are passionate about and pursue that and pursue it relentlessly. And do not let someone tell you no until uh, you have exhausted all of those opportunities, until you have talked with everyone who will listen to you. That's what I would encourage you to do. Whatever your passion is, pursue it relentlessly. And if your passion is the Air Force, or if you think it's one of the other military service branches, well, the Air Force is the best. But if you also want to join the Army or the Navy, I mean, I think that an Army or Navy officer would echo a lot of what I said today with the international aspect of what we do and the different opportunities that exist. So pursue whatever your passion is relentlessly. That's my advice for you. And if that's not the military, that's okay. There are so many ways to serve. There's so many ways to lead in your community. Uh, pick the route that works best for you and, and kind of work towards that. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Captain Brewer. And thank you again for being here. We want to thank Captain Brewer so much for donating her time and providing some very interesting information about her career history. We'd like to also thank you all for putting in your continued support for the IRC. I'd like to close by putting in a plug for some of our upcoming events. In particular, we have a great decision a lecture and another international career career series event in the upcoming week. If you're interested in them or any other IRC activities, we encourage you to check out our website for more information, irckc.org. There you can find a link to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to find a full recording of this conversation in case you'd like to revisit it alongside many others. Thank you so much for being here once again. Please stay well and we hope to see you all soon.